Alright guys, welcome back. My name's Sandy. This is Sawing with Sandy. If you're brand new as always, welcome aboard. Just made my way out here with the tractor. We got another storm that came in over the last day or so. And since we were out here last, we got a bit more snow that blew in the back of my shelter, but not too much. I just wanted to come out here and just have a quick look and see how things made out. The winds are still pretty high. We didn't get, I guess, a ton of snow compared to what uh, we might have gotten in previous storms, but it's enough that I figured I'd come out and have a look-see. And looks like the tarps are just fine and you guys can see a blow in there. That's pretty much what happens. I strap it down in the corners just so it doesn't get carried away, but that's for the most part what happens if you're going to be putting one of these up on your sawmill sheds. It just flaps back and forward a little bit. You can see up along the top there, that's how it's secured, just with a 2x4 that goes all the way across. And at the bottom there I have a, I don't even know what this is, one inch, inch and a half steel post off of a, off a fence I think it is, a chain link fence. That normally provides a bit of weight on the bottom. Every once in a while I just let it hang so that it keeps that, that tarp taut. Uh, in this case it didn't end up that way, but that's how it goes. You guys can see I just put some bungee cords around just to hold it in place and does its job. Definitely, uh, definitely better than not having it. If you guys have been here before, you've seen what happened. If you don't have that up, we get some blowing snow. It covers everything. And just by looking at my logs there, you probably can already guess that snow is not something we are short on around here. Anyways, that's that. All looks good. Let's head in on side here. Head inside here. I'm going to talk to you guys just a little bit today about a number of questions that have come up recently uh, dealing with why I don't sell lumber. I cut a lot of lumber, I'm not going to lie there, I've got a lot of trees, but I don't sell any of this lumber, at least not on a regular basis. So let's sit inside, we'll talk about that today. And one more thing I'm just remembering, I need to get some snow stops up there. I saw that recently in a comment and I thought, gee, that's a, that's a great idea, then the snow won't come off the roof. Won't be having to dig it out like this so I'm gonna have to figure something out up there I think you can get them that just screw through the steel into the uh, into the wood underneath maybe that'll be for the spring anyways inside looks pretty good Got a little bit of blowing snow back here nothing up here so I guess the moral of this story is I gotta remember to put these tarps down more often because this just saved me a bunch of work all right guys while we're here let's talk a little bit about how I got these tarps put up just in case you're interested so you guys can see, I just have a two by four in behind here. Uh, I run some, some washers and a screw through each of the eyelets on the tarp. And you're probably noticing that the washers are not the same. Around these parts, I just have a, a hardware drawer. I throw all my excess hardware in. And when it comes to projects like this, I don't tend to go to the store to buy little nits, uh, bits and pieces. I just reach into that hardware draw, drawer, grab what I need. So that's how the tarp is actually held up. On that same 2x4, I just have some, some uh, nails here. But you see that paracord, the green paracord? That's actually running along the other side of the tarp. You can see it. Then it comes to the bottom. And then it comes back up. And goes through this double pulley. Back down to an anchor point, which I tie off. Now there's two paracords here that run through this pulley. The second one goes along the top there through a single pulley. Back down to the bottom and then back up the other side to an anchor right there. All right, so that allows me to have some basic roll-up mechanism. Now in a perfect world, I probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be relying on the paracords. I might have something else to roll it up a bit easier, but this does the job. I only got these down the odd time in the winter. In the summer, I don't even use these tarps. So you pull on the rope, it uh, starts rolling with that steel bar that's in the bottom, and then it uh, gets to the top right about here and I just tie that rope off right there. Now, you'll see me from time to time having to help that, help that tarp get started. That's because these tarps are not custom made for this opening size, they're a little bit too wide. Also, the ropes are not perfect. Sometimes it wants to roll a little bit more on the left than the right, and it starts to angle a bit. So I just help it a little, and uh, you get it started, and then you can pull the ropes, and it comes up well the rest of the way. Anyways, over here, as I mentioned before, I use bungee cords just to hold the ends. Uh, what ends up happening if you don't do that, the wind will come in this way and this thing will fly way out. Now it's not a big deal on the ends, but I find it is a big deal on the front if you don't put these bungee cords. 
Another thing I do sometimes, if it's gonna be really windy, I take a rope, I tie the rope around the post, and I run it on the opposite side of the tarp, all the way to that end, and then I, then I pull it tight and tie it. That pulls the tarp right in here and holds it there, then it can't flop in and out. But they work pretty well. You know, maybe down the road I'll put some solid, uh, solid sides up, but I like to have it open most of the time, get to uh, see outside, and also makes it nice and bright in here. Anyways, let's get down to what I was going to talk about today, and that is why I don't saw wood for money. So when it comes to milling, 99% of the time, the wood you see around me is going to be used for my own purposes. The odd time, a friend of mine, maybe a family member, will grab a piece of wood off me, but the majority of it is going to myself. I don't use uh, sawing wood for a primary income source. I have another job uh, that I make money at, and as a result, that funds uh, the things I need to, to survive, obviously. Uh, when we talk about sawing wood, it is strictly a hobby for me. Uh, now it's a hobby that I can control how much time I spend at it. But uh, when it turns to a business and I'm selling wood, then I no longer have that control over how much time I spend on it. Especially if I got an order, paying order, and I need to get something done on a particular schedule. That's when that hobby element shifts over to a business and a, a, a time requirement is put on it. And that's what I didn't want to do. Hence why I don't cut wood for money. And just to be clear, I have absolutely no problem with the idea of starting a business with a sawmill like this, selling wood to customers out there and making money to make ends meet. That sounds like a great time, uh, in my opinion. But for me, I have a bunch of other commitments, and those commitments actually provide me with my primary income source. And because of that, that is going to not only take my time away from being able to meet all the deadlines and cutting requirements that customers would probably have, but it's also going to keep that cutting as a hobby. Uh, down the road, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. If the opportunity came up and I could cut wood in order to uh, maybe make a whole bunch of money or a little bit of money, maybe that would be a great thing for me to do. But at this point, with those other commitments providing uh, income source, uh, the wood cutting will stick as a hobby. Uh, with that in mind, now I did a bunch of research as I was thinking about today's video and I was looking into the competition that's out there because in the last few years it seems like a lot of people have got into sawmilling and uh, and cutting wood and a lot of people are also selling that wood and because of that they're providing competition especially in areas like where I live which is right in the heart of the Canadian Shield in central Ontario Canada and uh, that is something you'd have to consider if you are going to start selling wood. So as I was thinking more and more about this small time wood cutting operation and whether it would be a realistic goal of mine or maybe down the road it would be a realistic goal, I thought to myself I better price out what lumber costs at a larger sawmill in the area so that I can understand what these other small sawyers are, are competing against and what I would have to compete against. So I uh, looked around a little bit and the most local uh, sawmill that I could find that was, you know, relatively large volume, larger operation, uh, what I was finding was that not only were their prices uh, pretty reasonable, at least from a consumer standpoint, but they were also telling me they were having trouble getting material. So they were having trouble getting enough wood, enough logs, pine of course, pine, spruce and fir, to actually cover what they would normally sell. And because of that, they were limiting the quantities that they were selling and limiting the dimensions they were selling. So that's a bit of a downside for consumers, but an upside for small sawyers. The sawmill, the larger sawmill that I talked to, they said that because they were having trouble getting pine, spruce and fir, they were having to take the logs that they were getting and dedicate them to specific sizes that they could guarantee they could sell because no longer were they going to cut everything that they used to and just have it sit there and hope the customers come along. So they were restricting it to minimum volume purchases. I think they were doing uh, 500 board feet as a minimum, which in the grand scheme of things, I guess, isn't that much. But if you just need a little bit. So they were re reducing the, uh, the purchase volume to 500 board feet. They were also reducing the widths you could get. They were also reducing it to one inch and one and a half inch material. Well, that's fine and dandy. That covers a lot of stuff. But what if you need custom timbers cut? Well, they're not going to be doing that for you because they have such a scarcity of materials right now of, of, of logs. And so that's that opportunity for a small time sawyer like myself or the others who I would probably be competing with. Now, talking specifically about that larger sawmill that I spoke to 
uh, most most close to me what they were charging. They were charging a dollar twenty five per board foot for four and seven foot lengths, and they were charging a dollar fifty. And keep in mind, this is Canadian dollars, a dollar fifty Canadian per board foot for nine and ten foot lengths. Uh, so as you can see there, that doesn't seem all that bad if I were to factor in the cost of my material, my equipment, my time and come up with a figure that I would charge my customers because I would probably charge them somewhere close to there as well. So how do I compete with a larger operation like that? I have to go to custom cutting. And just before I go on and talk about custom cutting and where the money is in that potentially, I just want to compare the price of that sawmill I mentioned at $1.25 a board foot and $1.50 a board foot to the approximate board foot you're paying currently at a Home Depot. Now I brought up pricing in a recent video. Uh, I'm still using that same pricing. It was still very recent. And so uh, I wrote it down just as I've said many, many times, my memory is good but short. But here's the pricing recently at a Home Depot here uh, in Canada close to me. So when I say close, I mean closest to me. I don't really have them that close. Uh, two by four by eight, two by four by eight. Now this is pine, spruce or fir, uh, typical framing material at Home Depot. $8.68 Canadian for one. Two by six by eight foot length, $13.26. Two by eight, $23.48. Two by 10, $25.12. I can get an average board foot price of about $1.85 a board foot, eight foot lengths from Home Depot. Compare that to what I was getting at my local sawmill. I'm in the range of about $1.50 a board foot. It is a little bit cheaper to buy from the sawmill at $1.50 a board foot. Keep in mind the stuff you're buying from Home Depot has been planed. The stuff from the sawmill has not. It's rough sawn, although it has been kiln dried, just like the stuff at Home Depot. Now, when we get to a 10 foot length average per board foot at Home Depot, we're into $2 a board foot, 12 foot lengths at Home Depot, $2.10 10 Canadian per board foot. So as you can see there, it's more expensive from Home Depot, comes plain, still kiln dried like the sawmill so obviously a little bit more money at home depot compared with the sawmill where do you guys come in well i'm going to paint a picture for you now let's assume you're going to sell two by fours and i did a little bit of math on my spreadsheet might have to refer to it let's assume you can cut 100 two by fours eight feet long in a day and i'm thinking about my sawmill and i'm thinking about the effort that would be required to do that and it's pretty significant 100 two by four by eights you're getting into the range of 500 board feet uh, so if you're going to do that, well, you're going to be working to do that unless you have uh, maybe some help or who knows, maybe you're a little more efficient or faster than I am. But 100 two by fours by eight at a dollar twenty five per board foot. You're looking at about six hundred bucks and change. Let's get our number here. Six hundred sixty two dollars and fifty cents is what you'd be getting in your pocket if you sold 100 two by four by eights at $1.25 per board foot. Now that sounds pretty good, $660 and change, Canadian that is, but imagine the amount of work that went in to get that material made. Also remember, that does not factor in the price of the wood itself. And I don't mean selling it, I mean you getting it. If you live in a place like I do and you have trees galore, then maybe that's not a big deal for you because you have all these trees to get your wood from and technically it's free at least until all the trees are gone. But if you have to buy your logs, that becomes a whole nother story. So what I did was I went searching to see what it would cost for me to get logs delivered so that I could factor that into the price and come up with an actual profit figure if I were to run my sawmill as a business. So after doing a bit of looking around, one thing I, I found out, just like the larger sawmill found out, it was a bit difficult for me to get a load of saw logs. I can get a whole bunch of loads of, uh, of firewood logs. That's no problem. And firewood logs, you know, they're generally not that straight. They're not the, uh, the pristine logs, the nice straight ones that you're going to need to make nice lumber. And so I can get firewood logs, but I had a hard time finding someone who could deliver saw logs. That's the first red flag for me. But I did get a price on some, and it was approximately 70 cents per, um, per board foot. That's what it came out to be in order for me to get the logs delivered. Now that's obviously going to vary depending on where you live, but for me, 70 cents per board foot. If I were to factor that in my price, and I just wrote some stuff down here to give you some numbers. If I were to factor that into my price, 
that's definitely going to reduce that six hundred and sixty dollar uh, profit or profit I thought I'd get down to something quite a bit smaller. So here we go, two by four, eight foot longs. If I cut a hundred of them, as I mentioned, and charge a dollar twenty-five a board foot, I could make six hundred sixty-two dollars and fifty cents. Take into account 70 cents per board foot approximately to get the saw logs. That's my material cost, at least for the, uh, for the wood. My profit ends up coming down to 55 cents per board foot. Take that 55 cents per board foot, multiply it by the 100 2 by 4 by 8s I'm going to make, and what I end up with is $291.50 profit for 100 2 by 4 by 8s, $291.50. Canadian. Now you'd have to think to yourself, is that is that what you want to uh, is that what you want to make for that effort? And that sounds pretty good to me. But then I got to think of other things. What about the fuel cost in order to transport those logs to my sawmill? Uh, maybe they'll drop them off here. Not in my situation because they couldn't possibly drive a truck here. But let's assume at your situation they could drop them off right at the sawmill. But what about loading the logs? You're going to have a tractor like this or a, a front end loader of some sorts. There's some fuel costs. What about, um, what about all the waste? How are you gonna deal with that? What about the maintenance on your sawmill? What about the fuel in the sawmill? Um, what are you gonna do when you have something break in your sawmill? What about buying the sawmill, okay? All those things are gonna cut into that profit, whether it cuts in on the first order you get or you space it out and it continues to cut into the profit um, as, as time goes on. So you're listening to that profit number and you're thinking to yourself, ah, I don't think that's gonna cut it. I'm going to end up having something break. It's going to cost me a fortune. Any profits I made are going to be out the window. How are you going to make that profit number a little bit higher? Well, maybe you can find some way to get logs cheaper. Maybe you can charge more for the lumber. Or maybe you can just try to work faster. That whole faster thing, I don't know. I'm going to get to a point where I can only make so many board feet of lumber in a day. And so that number I'm going to have to play around with. But it's probably going to cap out at some point. Could I charge more for the lumber? Well, then again, we're getting back to the competition. Those people who are coming to you to buy rough sawn lumber, they're going to say to you, well, wait a minute, I can go to the sawmill and buy the lumber for this price. It's been kiln dried. Yours is air dried and yours is more expensive. Well, then you're going to come back to them and you're going to say, well, guess what? I can custom cut. That's when you may hook them. So maybe that's the location where you can boost the profits, custom cutting. That's why so many of those small Sawyers that I did all that research and found out about, why their prices are, you know, pretty good, many of them at, at least, but they're all doing custom cutting. Well, let's just assume the stars align, you get a customer that comes to you, they say, you know what, I don't need my lumber kiln dried, I can, uh, I can get it from you, it can be custom cut, and then I'll air dry it at my own place. Well, that's perfect, and that would probably be what I would do, because if I don't have to air dry it, then I can get the product, the lumber, shipped off to them quicker. Basically right off the sawmill, loaded into my truck, loaded into their truck and away it goes. If they don't want it until it's fully air dried, well have a look around me here. That's gonna take an awful long time from today, if I cut it today, to the point where it's dried, air dried, and going to the customer. So I would prefer to cut it, ship it to them immediately, and then let them worry about drying it. Uh, if you aren't going to do that, then you might, you might have to consider stockpiling material. That's a whole other issue. If you're going to cut material and have it ready so that when the customer comes along, you can say, yeah, it's right there. Well, then that starts to take away from the whole custom cutting situation, which is what the sawmill, the big competitor, uh, is doing. They're doing the big volume. They're doing the, uh, the uh, standard sizes. So I take that order they bring in and I say, you know what, whatever it is, I'll cut it. I'm going to give it to you green, meaning it's still wet, fresh off the sawmill. You dry it on your own time. Now, if the order is quite big, well, that's great for me because that means I'm going to have a decent paycheck after I get it all cut. But it's also going to mean I'm going to take a great deal of my time up uh, getting it cut. And that's going to hold back other potential orders that might come in. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if you have to wait too long for a product, then you start looking around a little bit. You start looking at maybe another Sawyer nearby and you say, you know what, I think I'll give them business because they're ready to go and I want to get my project on the go. So that's a potential issue. Likewise, if your project or the uh, order is too small, that order could not be making you enough money for the given time you're going to put into it. And so you're going to get to a situation where you might want to turn, turn, uh, turn away business. And if you turn away business, well, 
that's not really good because that person may never come back to you, especially when they have a larger order. Uh, so you got to really weigh out big orders and small orders in order to make sure you're doing what's best for your startup anyways. Doing a bit more research with some of the small sawmill operators, what I was noticing was that the dimensional lumber was all priced relatively the same. It was all pretty close to the larger sawmill operations price. Uh, and because of that, I didn't see a big opportunity for someone like myself to get in there and make much money. But what I did see was that the odd sawmill operator, the small ones, they were offering slab wood and I don't mean that slab wood, the waste, I mean like a live edge slab wood. So they'd take a large hardwood tree with a wide edge sawmill or a, a wide cut sawmill. They'd cut the top and the bottom in order to make a slab and they'd leave the edges with the bark on it. What I was noticing was that stuff was being offered as tabletops, uh, offered as um, uh, countertops, things of that nature. And it was being offered at a pretty high price, at least in my opinion. Then I started thinking about, well, what's the price of that log, saw log, in order to make that live edge material? And I'd imagine it's pretty high. Last time I went to buy a piece of hardwood, I pretty much looked at the price at Home Depot and I turned around and walked out. So maybe it's a bit cheaper somewhere for those people, but uh, I'd imagine the material cost is quite high, hence why they have to have the live edge price uh, that high as well. Anyways, guys, that's my two cents here dealing with making sawing a business. As I mentioned, it is not gonna be a business for me at this point. I'm gonna continue cutting lumber for my projects, for things I like to do. Uh, if down the road I decide to jump in headfirst towards that business idea, then maybe I will, but it's gonna come down to a numbers game for me. The numbers gotta make sense or I'm out. If you can imagine, if you're making pennies, and you're putting in all that effort, well, I should have just stuck with it being a hobby. Guys, you all take care out there. I'm glad you're here. Be well. I'll see you next time.